It is just a huge honor for me today to bring back for a second time Keith Washington. He's the vice president of products at ProSites. And he got so much, um, uh, there's so much discussion on Dentaltown about your first one. We thought we'd bring you back a year later to see what's changed. Keith Washington is the vice president of products for ProSites and has 30 years of software management experience and five years in the dental industry. Keith has a degree in accounting from the University of Maryland, and is, which was the first dental school in America, and has led product transformations at many successful companies. Keith started in product management and into its TurboTax division, where he led a transition to web-based tax software, which is uh, all over the news and controversial that TurboTax isn't letting everyone who makes <laughs> under uh, 69000 a year, file their taxes for free. We'll see if he comments on that. Later, he became the vice president of product management at a leading financial planning software company and most recently worked at Active Networks, the largest software as a service event management company in the world. ProSites helps dental and medical professionals accelerate practice growth and achieve measurable results through innovative website design and online marketing solutions, including search engine optimization, social media management, and pay-per-click advertisement, trusted by over 7,000 doctors, endorsed by 11 state dental associations, and recipient of the 2015 Dental Town Towny Choice Award, voted number one in website design and service. ProSite website design and online marketing solutions are proven to help dental and medical practices to uh, succeed. So how's it going, uh, Keith? How has uh, everything um, changed in the last year since you've been on the show? Howard, thanks for taking the time to talk about digital marketing. And I think you just said a lot right there in, the, in terms of the number of things that a dentist and a practice needs to focus on in terms of digital marketing. It seems like there's so many things to figure out. Search engine optimization, paid search, social media, Facebook, all of these things are becoming more complex. I think the biggest change is how to deal with all of it. And probably most importantly, how do I know I'm making any progress. Am I making any money on all of this? That's really pro probably the biggest things that are changing. It's, um, it, it, it's, I think why DSOs are taking off because dentists have to wear so many hats. I mean, it's so overwhelming just to learn fillings, crowns, root canals, let alone add Invisalign or placing implants or bone grafting that then you got to wear all these business hats. You got to be a CEO, HR, marketing, website. I mean, it's just, a, there's just too many hats to wear. How do, how do you guys uh, make it easier for dentists to wear less hats? Yeah, I think probably the way I think about it is our job and the job of many, um, we call ourselves digital marketing partners, is to help a practice get more patients and keep the ones that they have. And really, that's the, probably the most important thing we can do. How can we help you through automation, through us handling the digital marketing piece so that you can get a lot more patients in the door and, and really help you track your progress and track your return on investment. I agree with you that how does a dentist who really got into the field to really just be of service or to you know really learn how to do their craft, now they have to take on, take on all of these different components, all of, this, all of these different hats, as you said, that they have to wear. Our job is to help make that easy. So I noticed that... Um in your, if you're in the 20 most richest developed countries, they all have websites. But as you go to the 200 least less developed countries, a lot of them are skipping a website entirely and going with just a Facebook page. Do you see that as an intermediate step or is that really the future? Uh, should a dentist be promoting their own website or a website or a Facebook page? Yeah, we like to look at it. You know, I've seen this in other small industries. If you are a, um, if you run an auto shop, a lot of auto shops now, small auto shops or small businesses are going right to Facebook, and there's a reason for that. But a dentist is a professional, a practice is a professional, and you, as a potential consumer, are looking not just for someone who's on Facebook, but someone who has a digital presence. That includes a website. It includes a Facebook page. It also includes reviews on Google, and all of those. Those things help make me make a decision as to whether or not I'm going to go to you. I, I may have gotten a referral from a friend. Joe told me to go see Dr. Jones, but I'm going to go look and look at really quickly at their digital presence. Certainly, 
Facebook is taking off. Facebook um, has over 200 million U.S. users. And so we're seeing that growth and we're seeing the adoption in the number of people and the number of practices who are using Facebook not just as a presence, but as a tool for social media management and communicating with their patients, but now more and more taking advantage of Facebook advertising to help augment some of their advertising needs, some of their marketing needs. It seems like everything in the news about Facebook for over a year has been uh, less than pleasant. And I always cringe because the owner of Facebook, his dad's been on the show three times. And I always think, God, what if that was one of my four sons in the news? I'd probably be crying in the corner like a baby. Um, With all the negative publicity, starting with Cambridge and et cetera, do you see that um, having any impact on Facebook's um, and how dentists use it or its effectiveness? I mean, um, is it? Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. There's a lot of people who worry about Facebook and a lot of industries where they say, I'm not going to be involved in Facebook. But again, 200 million users, the average person spends 30 minutes a day on Facebook and the U.S. adoption continues to increase, especially in the 20 to 35 year old range. So there is no Facebook is not going to go away. And by the way, 214 million in the U.S., far out you know outpaces Instagram or any other platform Twitter any other platform by 10 times so it certainly is a marketing platform and just to give you some numbers I don't want to go too far but Facebook made 16 billion dollars in advertising revenue last quarter um, there's no reason to think that Facebook won't be able to do advertising and as a platform, for you to communicate or a practice communicate with their patients and get their message out, it's certainly something that um, is a positive, powerful, and probably probably most importantly cost-effective way to communicate with your local region. With Facebook, you can target the number of the users by income, by age, by geographic region. If you, like you said, just decided you're going to do implants or teeth whitening and you wanted to reach a certain age group – In your 20-mile radius with a Facebook ad, you can do that through Facebook pretty easily and pretty effectively. Yeah, because there's a lot of different practices. I mean, if you were um, wanting to place a lot of implants, you'd want a a bunch of older people, I would assume. Correct. Um, Right. What is the the age range you like for dental implants? Right. So if you think about implants anywhere from 45 to 60 years old, you know, even 70 years old are using are are taking advantage of implants. And it really um, comes down to understanding who your current patients are and then targeting those those people who are like them. It's really important to do that. And that's how we help. That's how we help a practice by understanding who's coming in the door, who's most likely to who's most likely to take advantage of the services, and then doing advertising to reach those people in the community. So you build the website, but you also help them um, market. Absolutely, yeah. You know, it's really interesting. 15, 12, 15 years ago, the whole goal was just to have a website. And the industry has grown so much from there. And the the practices know that. Then it became important for Google to find you through search engine optimization. And then Google launched paid advertising. And that affects where you're placed on the first page. Um, And then social media took off and being able to not just have a Facebook page, but to be posting regularly to keep your current patients engaged. More and more, we're seeing the complexity, but also the automation of digital marketing um, become more and more important in order to get patients. I don't want to underestimate the power of reviews also, um, whether it be Facebook reviews. More and more consumers, potential patients are commenting about practices on Google, on Facebook, on Yelp and knowing the impact of positive reviews on someone choosing you as a potential practice is very important. Positive reviews for what, what do you guys call that social um, affirmation? Is that what they're, they're calling that? Yeah, I think that's a good term for it. Social affirmation is in, is, is, is not just, you know, it's not just a buzzword, but consumers, People like you and me, and you do it as well when you're going to go look for a restaurant or anything that you're looking for, you go and see what their reviews are, and you're expecting to see four and five stars. And if you don't, I'm just going to go away, even if I got recommended. But if you have a two stars, a bunch of two-star reviews in a dental practice – 
that's a red flag for a lot of people, even if I was recommended by a friend. So we really help um, practices get more reviews, more positive reviews from patients, because if you're doing a good job, people want to tell other people about it. Everybody wants to talk about it social. Everybody wants to communicate what they're doing. Everybody thinks what they're doing is very important in any given day. So we really try to help them get that message out when they have their dental, dental checkup or dental experience. It really is interesting. Uh, it's just a massive human need to share because when they go back and look at um, uh, cameras, the first one, the Polaroid picture, I mean, you and I are old enough to remember <laughs> shaking that thing. Um, it really wasn't a, a picture for their own uh, remembrance. It was really it turned out to be something they wanted to share with others. I mean, it's like 99% right. of all photos are shared. They're not kept in your, uh, you know, for yourself. Uh, you're sharing it with you with your family. I mean, I you know I did all the time every, every time I, uh, my grandson sits on my lap, I have to take him a selfie and send it to mom. I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> right. it's just uh, it's just an interesting thing. Um, is Yelp going away? Um, they they're always in the um, a lot of news stories are saying that Google has really set out to own the review business and uh, making it harder and harder for Yelp views to even show up. Do you see Yelp trending downwards? under the Google um, pressure, or do you think it's here to stay for the next five to 10 years? Yeah, I think it's here to stay. You really, you, you bring up a good point in that Google is trying to own the review space. And when you look at a given page, type in dentist near me, you will see a Google review on the right-hand side. You will see Google review stars in the ads. You'll see Google reviews in the map. So they're trying to take over that real estate. But the first thing you see right under the Google map is a Yelp review. So Yelp is really, they're not going to go away. And it's important because Yelp tries to position themselves as an independent resource, like the consumer reports for online reviews. Um, and so then, you know, people, so many people trust the authority of Yelp, but Google will keep, you know, pushing because they own that real estate. They'll keep pushing reviews. We like to have our customers, our practices have reviews in multiple sources, even in, including health grades, which is which a lot of people still value. Um, it seems like it seems like I, I don't know, maybe it's because I was born in Kansas and I went to dental, you know, Creighton in Omaha, Nebraska and dental school in Missouri. But it just really seems like Yelp is a big um, East Coast, West Coast, big city thing in San Fran, San Diego, like where you're at, instead of Kansas or Missouri or Nebraska. I mean, I'm 56 and I've never seen anybody use Yelp. Do you think it's more a big city urban thing or do you think I just have a bunch of illiterate friends who don't know how to use Yelp. <laughs> I'm not going to comment on that, but I don't think it's a big city urban thing at all. And it really is a two to three second thing. When I'm looking at anything that I'm interested in engaging with, especially with a dental practice, when I go online, my visual clues are important. I'm looking at star ratings. I'm looking at their website to make sure that it has the right calls to action. Is it a current office? Does it look nice? Um, I'm looking at where they're located on the map. I'm looking at their hours. All of these things I can take in in two to three seconds. And we all do it, even subconsciously, to help us make a decision where we're going. If I have to choose between two practices, having positive Yelp reviews, having positive Google reviews, having a compelling website, being found on page one of Google, um, even on the website, having education for me with compelling videos. All of these things tie in to help me get another potential patient to call. And that's the whole goal. If we can get them to call your office, then you can help convert them. Interesting. Um, I noticed that... Um you talk about HTTPS website, uh, HTTPS, Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure, is an internet communications protocol that protects the integrity and confidentiality of data between the user's computer and the site. Is, that, is this a big deal? It certainly is a big deal to Google and being ranked high. If your website is not secure, have HTTPS associated with it, it affects where Google is going to rank you when someone's searching for a practice or a dentist near me. It is not um, necessarily, for instance, I'll tell you, ESPN is not HTTPS secure, and it's a number one website. So if you're exchanging information 
personal information on the website, it's critical. But if you're using it to fo- call a phone number or just find out more about a practice, it's not required except Google is expecting to see that when you want to get ranked. So if you want to get found and you want to have people have the comfort level that your website is secure and you're not potentially, they're not potentially passing information about themselves over the internet, then absolutely you want to have an HTTPS certificate. It's kind of a new thing because I notice now a lot of websites I go to a, a dentist, you know, I mean, probably I, I'm, I, I don't ever erase my cookies, so I'm so good. If I start typing in uh, Keith, <laughs> no. it just starts prompting Keith in all the dentistry. I mean, uh, you know, I tell people don't erase your uh, cookies because, I mean, Google knows if I'm going to go on the Internet, it's a 99% chance I'm looking for something dentistry. But I'm amazed that when I pull up dentist websites, the first thing you see is not secure on the left side. That's what you're talking about, right? In the toolbar. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. I exactly. mean, they're, they're, they're all not secure. So um, dentists uh, are just uh, oh. not aware. W- when did this really become a big thing? It's been over two years. And I would say that in our customers, most most of them have the HTTPS certificate. You don't, uh, it, it's not that expensive to get, it's really a SSL certificate. It's not that hard to get one. Um, we provide them for our customers. So um, if you're not, a, if you don't have an HTTPS website, it's almost like it, there's no reason for you not to. There just isn't any reason to not have it. Um, and it's not, it's not a big barrier. It doesn't cost that much to have an SSL c- certificate. We either provide it in some of our options included or or if you want to buy one separately, you can do that from us as well. Huh. So why do, why do you think ESPN doesn't do it? Because they're not asking you to exchange information. They don't care. They, they're not really – they're not taking in data. If you go to log in to ESPN Plus or a lot of these websites, they'll, then it will become secure. But they just don't care. They don't. They don't need. They don't need to have it to be secure. And I'm not saying that it's not important. Um, it really is something that you want to. What we try to do is eliminate anything that Google will downgrade a website for when someone's searching for them. And so, if that's something that Google and and you know protecting of internet information is important, we want to provide that for our customers. Well, ESPN has a very special place in my heart. It was actually on ESPN in 1998. We were building Dental Town, and we thought the best decision was to make it with all Microsoft software. And their message board system was just insane. I mean, nobody could figure it out. And we'd already yes. spent like $40,000 of Microsoft software building our message boards. And then um, um, I was on the ESPN website, and I was looking at how awesome their message board was. In the bottom corner, uh, was the name of the company. It was in London, and we called them up, and they said, "Yeah, we'll sell you software for four hundred bucks." So I'm like, <laughs> I already spent forty thousand with Microsoft, and had to delete all that, and and you know, half dozen programmers working on it to go with ESPN. So thank you, ESPN, for the Dental Town message boards. Uh, yeah, and ev- everybody was using that London company software for a long, long time. It was just amazing. That's right. Um, so I, I noticed websites have changed a lot. I've seen this rodeo before with the ATM machines when I was 10 years old. It seems like a lot of people, um, as social animals as we are, as much social affirmation that we want that you're a good dentist, people at the end of the day don't really like to deal with people. They would rather deal with an ATM machine or make it a dental appointment online uh, then wait for some human to answer and put them on hold and this and that. Are you seeing, I mean, you, you got a huge sample of 7,000 uh, doctor's offices in the United States. Do you see online appointments uh, making a breakout? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. We, as I talked about at the beginning, we think that improving the patient experience and and most importantly, engaging with patients in the way that they want to be engaged with is critical to helping a practice keep their current patients. Starting with how do I book an appointment? Because I don't have time to call you necessarily at nine o'clock in the morning because I'm working if you're only open at nine o'clock. So give me the opportunity to book an appointment. Then send me a reminder. Please don't call my home number. It's so funny. You call my home number. I actually don't answer my home phone. I don't. I, I, it took me a while to remember that I actually had a landline. But send me a text reminder so that I can be reminded automatically. And then probably something that we found 
um, was really important was make it easy for me to get onboarded. And that is giving me an online patient health history, patient information form to fill out before I go into the office. Do you know how many times, and you've done it before, you go into the dental office, it's nine o'clock, my appointment's at nine, I've got to get back to work by 1030. And the first thing I have to do is I get a clipboard and I have to take 20 minutes to answer questions that I can't remember most of the answers to. And what if I can do that before I go in the night before so that when I check in, I can be you know easily sent right into the lab chair and the doctor can get critical information in advance. So if I have diabetes or if I am at risk for diabetes and I check that box, they know that before I even come in. We find that being able to onboard a patient in a way that they're used to working and being more automated is critical to helping improve the patient experience. I'm more likely to go back time after time after time if I don't have a bad experience. It's 10 o'clock. I still haven't been, I haven't been seen because we have a backlog because I'm filling out forms or my, you know, or I forgot my appointment and I'm scrambling around. So you're absolutely right. Being able to automate that in, in starting with online booking all the way to the time that I leave, um, leave that office is, is becoming not only, not only important, but also standard. Yeah, and it's something so frustrating. You know, the American government pays for so much health care between Medicare and Medicaid. And, I mean, it's just a huge expense. And every time I see a study done on the expense, 30% of it is paperwork. And it's like, yeah. it's like I, I'm a dentist. Like, I mean, it's 2019. They come in and they still have to uh, show me an insurance form. And we have to have a human Call. I mean, it, we still yes. in our office have a full time person that calls every single dental uh, insurance for every single patient, and we wait till we talk to a human because it's worth it in our thirty two years experience not to have to deal with all the confusion uh, when we think something uh, versus what's covered, and I I just can't believe it's not all automated. I mean, even and the it, dental offices that have online forms, they're just there to print out. And then you have to have a printer at home and then you have to fill them out and bring them in. And that data has got to be, I mean, it's just, it, 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 I mean, it's just so, if, if they just sit there and made all of that um, paperwork uh, go away and if they, uh, and then if they use uh, simple insurance uh, mechanisms like co-payments um, to, um, you know, when you tell grandma she needs a $50,000 uh, knee replacement and she says, and it's not, won't cost her a penny. And she's like, well, you're the doctor. Well, then someone's got to pay 50000 But if you said you have a 10% copay, your portion's 5000 half of them would say, you know, I'll just take Bufferin. Uh, you know, uh, so so the, these two simple steps, why is it taking health care so many decades just to do so much of the basic stuff, especially in dentistry? I mean, why isn't there just an app for Delta? When someone's got Delta, they come in, they pull up their app, they show me a barcode, boom, done. Yeah, it's a problem we're working on solving. And I will say that our online form solution, you don't have to print them out. Um, it is an interactive online form, and that form data gets put right into the practice management system. So there's no need to print them out in the office and then have to rekey them, which introduces another element of error. It's all online and it and, and provides, by the way, critical insurance information before I walk in there. I don't know if I can solve the problem of having to call the insurance companies, but it's something that's important to us um, to be able to automate insurance verification. We think we can do that. And we think that that's becoming, it, it, it's going to become important because without it, you're just wasting time at the front office. You're wasting time with the person who's trying to do so many things. You know, we talk about the dentist doing so many things. Imagine the person who's in charge of the front office having to juggle so many things just to keep the calendar full, which is probably their primary goal. So we, we think that insurance verification, but also, as you pointed out, providing me information up front with how to pay for this. I talk about this all the time when, when I go into a dental office and they say, okay, here's a finance person and the bill is going to be $400. Would you like to have the treatment done now? And my answer is always this. Most people say this. 
I'll have to think about it. And the reason I have to think about it is because I don't know. Is my insurance covering some of this? Am I, I didn't walk in expecting to pay $400 or in your case, $5,000. And so my answer is I'll think about it and let you know. And then 30% of us never come back. And that's treatment acceptance and helping people with understanding their financing needs and what insurance is covered is critical to increasing patient acceptance and treatment plan acceptance. So how do you, how does ProSites help them um, with their financial arrangements? Well, so really interesting, who's the biggest financing, dental financing company? Care Credit. Care Credit provides financing for almost 90% of dental practices. So in our website, we have, because we have a relationship with Care Credit, an easy way for a patient and as well as a practice to be able to write on the website, apply for financing in advance of even coming into the office. So if a practice is utilizing that information and then providing it to the patient before they even come in. So if I say I need implants, send me the, send me the Care Credit link. I can apply for financing. And then if I need it, I have it. And if I don't, I know what all of my options are. So we put that right on our website to help the practice better communicate with their with their potential patients. Now, they just um, changed ownership, right? That's uh, correct. They're owned by um, Synchrony. That's right. Or, That's right. At the end of the day, they're a bank. They're uh, bank so, so it's owned by my Synchrony, correct? That's right. So that's right. has that? Uh, how long has that been about? I think that's been at least over a year, and it hasn't impacted what Care Credit is providing in terms of financing for for um, for dental patients. So it's the uh, same same game. Uh, hasn't really same changed. Game. That's right. Um, same thing. And as a matter of fact, it's a benefit to the practice because the you know the practice's relationship with Care Credit also provides benefits to them. Huh. Um, so when you. Um, when you talk about the, um, the your your paperwork being uh, filled out online, that, that that's a rare thing. I mean, there's two hundred eleven. There's one hundred fifty thousand full time dental offices in general. Thirty thousand specialists. Right. What percent of them do you think you can fill out the healthcare line uh, forms online, where it goes right to the practice management information system? Yeah, I was surprised to see that over 90% of our customers put a PDF on their website right, when, before right. we started doing this. And I think that's okay so that I can write it in, but it still has human error. We're seeing, we saw adoption grow to now almost 30% of our customers who use online patient forms that are interactive. It only asks me as a, as a patient the questions that apply to me. If I have family members, I, can, I don't have to start all over every time time that I have a family member, it really speeds up their process. And so we're seeing that adoption continue to grow. I was surprised at the, that we are meeting a need that is, you know, really so apparent in the industry and being able to have an online form that makes it easy for a patient to fill out, that goes into a practice management system that provides critical care information to the doctor in a critical care outline and lets, lets the that's the potential. That's the doctor before I even see the patient know all of the facts that I need to know about this patient. And and you you think that's uh, that's taken off? I know it's taken off, and I think we're just at the beginning. Really, this whole concept of patient experience, we're just at the beginning of understanding how to change that over time. Some of the, I tell you, one of the good things and bad things about this industry is that change happens slowly. And so it means that you're not going to, we're not fumbling around making a lot of mistakes all the time. But it also means that it gives us time to get it right the first time. And so um, I'm, I'm, I think that you will see, you, you'll see, look back five years, things that you thought would never take off or things that, you know, thought, oh, it's going to take forever, now are just standard. When I talked to, if you talked to me five years ago and you would have said to me, I'm never, why do I ever care about Facebook? Why do I ever care about social media? Now that's just standard. So a lot, a lot of the the argument about Facebook versus Google is that okay? So you're uh, you got 200 million Americans on Facebook. They're on there half an hour a day. They're scrolling by. You see something from a dental office website, big deal. You're not in the mood. But when you're absolutely in the mood, your tooth broke. You Google dentist near me. That's right. And that, that, that's a Google thing. So the question is, what's more important, a Google ad or a Facebook ad? Yeah. So great, great question. We look at it as what's more, why don't you do both and then track 
to see what's working. Um, really, more and more, we're trying to showcase or show people the return on investment, show practices the return on investment. If I spend $200 on Facebook in a given month and I get two patients, do you think that's worth it? It may be for a given practice. If you think about just how much revenue they can make from those two patients in a year alone, well, think about if they get to keep them for five years. So look at that. And then if I spend $300 in Google advertising and I get two patients, is that worth it? Making sure that we know that a practice knows what's coming, what's what's providing the best return on investment. If I live in Kansas, it may not be Facebook ads. If I live in New York City, I need to have a multi-prong approach to all of my marketing activities. It's not just sending in mailers in the in the neighborhood anymore, although that still does work. It's a multi-prong approach and then tracking everything that you spend money on to see what works and then spending more money on that. And it's sad because the dentists, you know, they, they figured out, you know, algebra and geometry and trig and calculus, and they know the cosine and the and, tangent, but then they get on their anatomy. practice. And then they get on their practice management software, and it's just not easily to find out is, you know, how much are you paying for a new patient uh, to get in your office? What is a new patient value worth? What is the lifetime value? I mean, could you imagine if you were coming into my dental office and in the 32 years you had referred 10 people who'd referred 20, who'd referred to, I mean, it doesn't, right. it doesn't even let me know the pyramid effect of Keith Washington, of what you have meant to my practice over 30 years. Um, when you're syncing online forms with practice management uh, software, what dental office practice management software um, are you synchronizing with e most easily? If, if you're a young kid who just graduated last week and we're going to start your own office, do any of those practice management systems look better than others or any of them um, you stay away from? Yeah, I'm not. A, I, or, I, or is that politically um, too dental, incorrect yeah, to ask yeah, someone no, uh, that? Yeah. You know, dental practice management systems um, are really based on their, their whole goal was insurance billing. And so they have grown over time into a lot of different components. And some of them are better at some things than others. Our online patient forms can be put in the folder of any dental practice management system. We're currently mostly integrated, most tightly integrated with Dentrix. Dentrix is the, pro, the, the largest provider. I will tell you that over the next five years, there's another potential opportunity for growth. For someone who's been in software for 30 years, I've seen, um, I've seen changes when when you know when you have some that if somebody who's been around a practice management system that's ubiquitous there's opportunity for someone new to come in and so I think they all know it I think it's a it's a critical application our goal is to integrate with all of them our goal is to be um, to be you know I, I guess agnostic about the dental practice management system and support the practice in the best way that they need but you just said that you've seen in other industries where some software innovation came along what what type of innovation are you uh, uh seeing or what what type yeah. So you use practice management systems a lot, and I've seen and, and worked with a lot of them, and some of them are cumbersome to use. Some of them you've had to spend so many hours in training in, in being able to use that solution, but you don't spend hours in training or even use a manual anymore in most of the new software things that you purchase. It becomes it becomes almost required that everything that you do is easy to use and, and is self it, it doesn't require training. So I think there's an opportunity, and I know that the practice management systems are looking for ways, and someone new will come along to come up with a seamless, easy-to-use practice management system that doesn't require 25, 30 hours of training for each one of your staff members. And it's all cloud-based. So you don't have to spend a lot of money on servers in your office. So a lot of companies are, are going that way. Again, our goal is to get the patients in and, and help help you um, help you convert them. But the practice management system industry is just ripe for you know a, 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 a change in the way that people interact with it. Do you see any uh, uh, emerging players that attracted your attention? 
Yeah, there's a, a, a I don't want to you know call them out, but there are co- companies who started in the cloud. It's really interesting. You mentioned TurboTax a long time, right at the beginning of this, and TurboTax was a desktop application. And we were when I was there, we were you know we had to get ahead of the internet and the web, or these web only tax software companies would come along. And so now cloud based, somebody who's natively cloud based, um, has an advantage because I can make changes to my software without having the practice have to update their server. So if you if you look at companies that are natively cloud based, those are the ones that will you know likely take off and and have an impact on the industry. What you're saying is, is so factual because Dentrix is the leader. And I remember going up there 32 years ago, I mean in Provo, Utah, and talking to the founders right. and he's writing to their Mike Gordon. But if you look at the biggest hotbed of all the dental innovation companies, they're all right next to where Dentrix started. I mean, Dentrix, they're calling it the the new state of dentistry. The um, I mean, the, they're calling it the, um, you know, like Silicon Valley. They're calling it right. Silicon Slopes. I mean, I mean, just think right next to Dentrix. I mean, you got, um, you got, um, my gosh, uh, Boom Cloud Dental Membership Software, uh, CAO Group, um, Curve Dental, Dental ATM, Dental Intel, Dental Marketing. Uh, you got the God of Dentistry, Gordon Christian. There, you got um, you got right. Jive Communications, Max Tech, My Social Practice, Oratech, Ortho Select, Pioneer Lasers, Podium. Um, I mean, um, um, Wave Ortho, Weave, uh, Clear. I mean, it was it's and and I always thought to myself. Man, every one of those companies should have been a feature of Dentrix. I mean, just every, that's everyone, great. but yeah. that's not how free enterprise works because you got an idea, you tell your boss, he tells you to forget about it. So you just leave <laughs> Dentrix and you, you start your own company. Um, cloud, though, a lot of people think cloud is great until on the message boards they tried it for their to replace their phones with voice over internet protocol. And they didn't realize um, how their internet connection was not nearly as good as they thought it was uh, when they were on the internet and they were on Google or social media or Facebook or Dental Town. But man, once they switched to the phone, they realized they did not have the internet that they thought they did. Do you think? Do you think cloud computing is still bleeding edge, or do you think it is now um, crossed the podium to leading edge? Yeah, so cloud computing is certainly leading edge. Um, all of our websites are now hosted on Amazon Web Services. Um, we considered that to be the industry standard in cloud in in cloud hosting solutions. Um, voice over IP certainly is taking off. Um, we use a voice over IP phone system, but you're right in that having a phone system in a dental practice and you're a dental practice and you're going to get you know 30 patients today and your phone system is broken that's mission critical to you and you don't have options and so we encourage people to be careful about that and if you're going to use a voip system use a voip system for someone who's actually a phone provider um, we, we you know we've we we own practice we own um, patient retention software and pa- patient notification software and there are a lot of companies that started their own you know voip phone system to coincide with it and we like to look at it if you really want to replace your phone system go to phone system providers, go to best of breed rather than just someone who adds in potential, you know, phones or, or purchased a phone system to go along with something else. But you're right. It's important that your phone system work. And even though voice over IP is going to, is not, not a bleeding edge, but it's certainly taking off. You have to know about your neighborhood. You have to know about, you know, your internet infrastructure before you switch over. Did you learn that from Mr. Robinson? Get out to what do you meet, mean? Get out to meet your neighborhood. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> you, uh, you, uh, I'm in Phoenix and you're in Temecula, California, but uh, north of San Diego. Um, you come out here a lot because you guys still own uh, Practice Mojo, which you bought from uh, Smart Practice, which was started by Jim and Naomi Road. Um, so, right. what's uh, how does Practice Mojo uh, fit in with ProSites or that? Yep. So we we consider that a key part of our patient experience. So when um, through marketing and our digital marketing services, you get a new patient, we want to provide automated reminders and we want to provide it in a way that customers or patients want to be reminded. Phone calls, text, 
some some with postcard and some with emails and being able to have that level of flexibility in the office and automation in the office is important we also purchased it because we consider uh, mojo not just a notification software but a campaign marketing component mojo has over 300 campaigns email campaigns that you can send out to patients like for benefit reminder season or if you now do implants or teeth whitening or you have a new seric machine so that you can communicate to the uh, to your patients here's what's going on you can do that by email you can do that in a way that keeps them coming back reminding them of their six month checkup automatically without having a high level of overhead by your front office staff. So that's why we purchased it so that we could take this leading platform and use it as a digital marketing tool and a patient engagement tool. So you also... Um Practice Mojo has the um, the dental postcard feature. Are, are, is that, are you doing that? Is that a big deal? That's correct. Oh, absolutely. We were surprised to see it. Actually, it's been growing a little bit. So um, Practice Mojo supports postcards still through Smart Practice, the leading provider of print materials um, to, the dental, to the dental community. And so we still print out postcards um, automatically based on the practice's needs to customers in terms of reminders, in terms of notification. And it's been ticking up slightly. And so, um, you know, I think that may be a testament to the type of customers that we – that, that our practices have because it may be older people who, you know, still like to have something on postcard. But it also, you know, is, is an understanding and that people want to be communicated differently. And so providing all of the options that, that make it easy for us to communicate with a patient is important. Yeah, I just want to remind everybody, you know, when, you, when you're making a decision, you got to always remember two things. You're, you're, there's there's so much more information that nobody knows at this point. So, you know, when, you, when you're trying to make a decision, you got to remember that you're not dealing with perfect information. And number two, the biggest bias in your whole life is yourself. And so many of these younger millennials, they, they, they hate junk mail. They call it junk mail. They don't like their mailbox. They think it should go away. But, but everybody who measures this stuff says emails and direct mail are still the two biggest features. I can remember being down in smart practices down there on um, uh, McDowell Road 30 years ago when Jim bought his first postcard printing machine. I think he paid $5 million for it. And back then, everybody wow. knew direct mail was a monster huge. But as all the social media came along, they, they acted like direct mail went away. And why it's so confusing is because 99% of it is thrown away. But my gosh, when one when you're doing implants and you mail to everybody in your neighborhood that's over 65 and one out of 100 grandmas looks at that card and calls your office, I mean, that is just a cash cow. When I look at when I talk to a lot of these DSOs here on the show where they they want, you know, a big new patient flow of 100 new patients a month, they say, "Well, it's real easy. We just if we want 100, we have to mail out 100 postcards 100 times." Every month. I mean, if we want to, if you want uh, 50 new patients, you mail out 50 100s. There's 5,000. And it is extremely uh, powerful marketing that, um, remember, if you're a millennial and you hate direct mail, uh, grandma and grandpa don't hate direct mail, and it, it still works. Um, I, another confusing marketing thing is uh, orthodontists because they want to be all hip and cool to the, uh, the kid in high school to come to the office. But the orthodontist knows, well, that kid ain't paying for it. The mom is. So how do you do, how do, you do advertising when you want to uh, get the young kids in for your orthodontic appointment, but you got to get mom and dad in to pay, drop the 6500 bucks. How do, how do you split that marketing when you have two? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great, great point. Mostly, mostly you're still marketing to mom and dad, even though it may be the teenager. The teenager has already talked to mom and dad, I need braces. As a matter of fact, they've talked to mom and dad for the past five years about it. Um, it's same, same with my, t my teenager. First, I took me, you know, three years to convince him that they should get, he should get braces because he didn't want braces. And then it became the point that dad, I want braces. And so you still market to the, 
to the parents. What we're seeing more and more is adult orthodontics taking off, that more and more people in their 30s and 40s are now getting braces or, or Invisalign and, and, um, and wanting to have their teeth straightened. And so we're changing some of our marketing tactics and look at Facebook advertising to that market to help augment the young, you know, the teenager or the, you know, the early teen market. That's where we're seeing an opportunity. Um, back to the website, online reviews, what, how, what advice would you give to a dental office to get more positive online reviews? Yeah, quite simple. Ask your patients. Uh, just that, that simple. And, and you should ask them in ways, again, that they feel comfortable. So if you harass them as they're walking out the door, and I talk about this a lot, um, number one, you should send them an email thanking them and don't ask them for a review. Ask them for feedback. We'd like to get your feedback. It's called a review, but we'd like to get your feedback. Um, and ask them in an email or send them a quick text and say, could you provide me with feedback? Our websites provide an easy vehicle for someone to go on and leave feedback, and that feedback goes right to the doctor. I will say this also. You should know the whether or not a patient is happy or dissatisfied with your service before they leave the office. Never let an unhappy patient leave your office unhappy. Make sure you check in. Are you doing okay? Make sure you know that they're going to leave you a positive review and then ask for it. It's similar to what you just talked about in direct mail. If you ask 100 patients to leave a review or leave feedback by email or text, you're going to get two of them. And those two have a great big impact on your office uh yeah and then um back to the um financial or, or the treatment plan acceptance what, what, what do you think is the best way a dentist can use their own um pro site software to increase their ca uh, case acceptance yeah um, one of the things that we're um we're just rolling out is new education videos and i look at patient acceptance and we understand that patient acceptance is in this way. Um, when you have a treatment plan, you really should focus less on just financing, but focus on explaining what the treatment is. So here is what the problem is. Here are what your options are. Here, let me show you, and we have videos to help you show right there at the chair side. Let me show you how easy this particular treatment is or how difficult it is what the benefits will be after they've had that treatment, and then I can help you pay for it or I can help you get financing for that treatment. It really is about that chair-side experience rather than just focused on the dollars with an invoice and then saying, please follow up with the, you know, with the front office and make an appointment. It's really about that chair-side experience that we're helping um, practices through education videos, reminding them about the financing options, helping them understand what the insurance options are, and then having a conversation. Most patients will accept treatment if you have a transparent, honest conversation with them about their treatment needs. Um, so this is Dentistry Uncensored, so I want to ask the, uh, the tough questions. Um, the, the, biggest uh, the, the biggest argument against a company like ProSites is that um, you should have a unique custom website because if you go with a company that has a hundred or a thousand websites, uh, Google um, doesn't search them the same. They say they're all cut and paste and that um, to be unique, you would want, want to hire your own programmer and just build your own website. What would you say to that argument? You've had to have heard it I'm before. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that. Um, and I want to make sure I clear it up. We do have 7,000, over 7,000 customers, and we have hundreds of styles to choose from in our library. But it doesn't mean that you're just picking that design style and, and, and it copying something else. You can customize that design style however you want it, all the way from whatever tagline you want, whatever images you want, all the way to a full custom website. We have customers who say, I don't like images any of your styles, build me something new. We do that as well. We also have a content library. It doesn't mean that all of the content is the same, but we provide um, content to help you get started. And then we configure that content to meet your particular practices needs, whether it be procedures or about your office. All of the content is configurable either by us, we'll do it for you for free, or you can do it yourself. So there's no duplicative content. There's 
there's no concern that all of my websites look the same. All of our websites, imagine we're just giving a great starting point at a low price, and then you can manage and change it with our help at no extra cost anytime you want. We also will change that style for you anytime you want at no uh, no additional cost. And we call that future now assurance. So anytime I change the technology, when I move to Amazon or I upgrade our website engine, we provide that to our customers at no no additional cost. And and outside of dentistry and dental specialists, what um, other doctors do you do? So we also do a number, we do plastic surgeons as probably our number two um, customer base, and, and they have a high level of customization, as you can imagine, because they um, want their image to be different from anybody else. We also support vets, so we have the, you know, the second largest um, veterinary website provider. Um, in the industry. So we provide a lot of different vet styles and a number of other small uh, medical um, groups, including bariatric surgery, for example. Um, We also do um, orthodontics, of course, and uh, optometrists and ophthalmology. A physician in America, you open up your practice and you sign up for, uh, say, Medicaid and Medicare. Well, you're booked three months in advance. Say they have no reason to try to get a new patient and thus they can't sell their practice. So dentists, you know, when when you see all these practices for sales, you got to remember physicians can't sell their practices. I mean, anybody that takes Medicare, Medicaid has more uh, patients than one. So you're talking about cosmetic surgeons, plastic surgeons, bariatric surgeons, veterinarians. Those are really um, the last bastions of uh, free enterprise in healthcare. Because uh, once you go to a state-owned uh, or a state-sponsored system, um, all these rules of economics and patient engagement and patient marketing are, are gone. Uh, right. Would you agree with that? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. You have – I agree with the concept of, you know, especially in the plastic surgeon market, the free market. Um, they're a high-touch, high-value group um, who are really – it's based on their ability – to provide a service to a, a niche market, and so our, you know, us being able to partner with those with those types of industries really um, requires us to have serious marketing chops to be able to do that. Yeah, and and it's really been a constant reminder for me for thirty uh, two years where I fall because I've had a four thousand square foot dental office. And across the street from me, there's been a 6,000-square-foot veterinarian office. And it started with yeah. the, 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 the man he founded, then his daughter took it over, now it's you know, um, on to someone else. And um, I, I cannot tell you in 32 years how many times I've told someone they need to fix their teeth, and they told me they can't because they just dropped $5,000 across the street uh, on, on their, their cat and dog. And, and it's, um, it's, very, um, it's very interesting uh, how people will find the money for what they value, and uh, that's um, – I mean, it's just amazing, um, and the plastic surgeons, the bariatrics. But back to dentists, I've always said that the number one, you know, when they always talk about high tech, they always want to know if they should buy a CBCT or a laser or a CAD cam or all that. I always say the number one return on investment is always um, a digital camera. And these plastic surgeons, the ones in Phoenix that I know that are closing the most cases, it's because when someone comes in for a consult, they're showing them before and afters of their own work. They're not giving them a brochure from the American, uh, you know, uh, Cosmetic Association. They're saying, this is what I did. And a lot of the guys who do like facelifts or tummy tucks or breast augmentation say there's only about, about four cases they do. So once they see what you are, and they show you a dozen before and after pictures of this exact case of my own work, it, it, it means everything. It means, it means it, it's, it's the whole deal. So, on, um, so for dentists uploading their own work uh, to their website, how easy is that? As long as, and you know this, as long as you're getting um, sign off from the patient, it's important. Um, we see, and you asked me how easy it is, it's quite simple. It, all you have to do is go into our editor, and we provide a page, an out-of-the-box page for before and after photos. But we see the number one place of, after the home page that every consumer goes to is, number one, about the doctor. So that page is really important, and that's a custom page. Number two, meet the team. 
I want to know who the team is at number three before and after photos. And so I agree with you 100 percent. Buy a digital camera. All you have to do is upload those photos to the computer Get them, you know, into our editor, and we will make sure that they look pretty, and make sure that they showcase what you want. So all those three pages, and then they, from that point on, um, patients, potential patients, look at videos, go to the procedure pages, learn a little bit more, and and become educated before they come in. But you're absolutely right; having those before and after photos is critical. Um, my God, we talked about so many things. Is there anything you wish we would have talked about that we didn't get to? Well, you're right. We did talk about just about what a wide range of things. I just, you know, first of all, I want to thank you for for taking the time. It's 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 it is an exciting time in digital marketing. It is an exciting time in automation of patient experience. I just encourage, you know, all of all of the practices who listen to your 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 podcast and and engage with Dental Town to continue to look at what their marketing components are, where they're spending their money, and asking providers even like like us, what's my return on investment and how can I make that better? Right on, right on. Well, Keith, thanks for coming on a second time. And what I um, want every dentist to do when they get to work is um, go look at your website. I'm thoroughly convinced most dentists listening have not even looked at their own website in a very, very long time. And then I also um, um, think that a really neat um, um, exercise to do is, you know, in business, everybody should have their own unique selling proposition. Well, you know, you're in a, you're in a town of 10,000 people. There's 12 dentists. When's the last time you and your team looked at the 12 websites of all the dentists in the Valley? One thing you'll find out that I've always found out is you'll, um, one of your best buddies across the street, uh, maybe he's an implant legend in his own mind and, and very, <laughs> right. very, very well, um, good enough to, to do an implant on me any day of the week. Yeah, you go to their website, you you would never know that. And it's, right. it's like it's like you have – sometimes you're sitting there at a bar with a dentist, and, he, and after 20, 30 minutes, you're looking at the dentist's own website, and you're like, wow, this, this website isn't even a connection of the guy sitting next to me eating a cheeseburger. I mean, how come all he's talking about – is bone grafting and placing implants and emergence profiles. And when you look at his website, uh, you, you don't see any inkling of any of this. And then when we were little, um, only the rich people uh, could fly airplanes or they work for a big Fortune 500 company or the government. Now people are, are living in these small towns are thinking, I don't think my dentist could do this and I really want to have this done. And, and, and Southwest Airlines only cost me $200 to fly from Salina, Kansas to Kansas City or Dallas or Oklahoma and let some big city doctor do it because you know they're just so much better in the big city and they're not any better in the big cities it's just uh, but the competition in the big city um, makes the uh, the dentist uh, pay more attention to their website and uh, and so you just you just got to take this serious first impressions are set in lead you never get a second chance to make a first impression and your website really needs to be as good as it can be. That's so, absolutely right. So, Keith, thank you so much for coming on the show a second time. You'll have to come back in another year or two. Or maybe uh, when you're down uh, um, visiting Practice Mojo, you have to bring the Practice Mojo people over to the studio. Oh, I'd love to do that. That's great. I appreciate you taking the time. All right. And post a picture of their postcard printer because I'm sure all the millennials listening do not believe <laughs> that there's still money to be made off a postcard in direct mail. <laughs> That's great. Great point.